Hello everyone. So, um, this week we have been talking about some of the wastewater treatment systems as a whole and uh, last couple of lectures we did talk about the basic conventional systems, how they are assembled, uh, how their uh, unit sequencing is made and in the last class we talk about, uh, we did talk about the wetland systems. So, this particular class we are going to uh, discuss a uh, few kind of relatively newer system when we compare them with the conventional activated sludge process or that way though they are not that new though. So, uh, eventually we are going to talk about sequencing uh, batch reactors which is typically uh, pronounced as SBR. So, SBR and there is another uh, modification to SBR kind of which is SBBR sequencing batch biofilm reactors. So, this is what we are going to uh, discuss in this class. So, uh, the sequencing batch reactors or SBR what typically we call are uh, kind of a different configuration of the conventional activated sludge process. So, what happens in a conventional activated sludge process we have the wastewater coming in after a primary sedimentation or a primary settling tank and thereafter it eventually goes to the next stage which is your aeration tank. So, uh, aeration is provided, oxygen is provided in that aeration tank and uh, the kind of uh, your carbonaceous BOD or CBOD degradation takes place over there. So, reduction in a CBOD is achieved in the aeration tank where your microorganisms decompose the organic matter and th that is how COD or BOD is reduced and uh, sludge mass is produced. So, that sludge mass or the what we call is mixed liquor. So, water along with that because it is a suspended growth process. So, water along with those sludge mass is taken to a secondary sedimentation basin, secondary settling tank which we typically call and from there it is separated and effluent comes out. So, there are different processes of primary settling then uh, degradation of organic matter uh, in a aerated tank then the removal of the biomass in the secondary settling basin. So, these different processes takes place at the different uh, kind of units or different stages uh, in a conventional activated sludge treatment systems. However, in a SBR which is uh, again works on a similar principle, but in this the processes are operated in a batch mode. So, not as in a conventional activated sludge which is usually a kind of uh, continuous process. Here the processes are operated in a batch. So, one batch of the water will be kind of uh, processed for one step and then it will be same batch of water is processed for second step, third step that way. So, it, it usually done in a batch that is why we, we call it a batch reactor. So, it is done in a batch and then each batch is sequenced through a series of treatment stages. Okay. And that is how the name has come sequencing batch reactor because these different batches are sequenced uh, in kind of a series of various treatment stages various removal steps. So, that is how we call this sequencing batch reactor or it is also refers that sequenced batch reactor. Okay. So, all the processes including sedimentation, biodegradation, biosolid separations are all achieved in the same reactor, but at different stages and at different times. So, uh, what happens there are 5 different stages in a typical uh, sequencing batch reactor operation cycle. Okay. So, these stages if we see, so these are the stages where the first at first filling takes place. Okay. So, influent comes in a tank in a uh, batch tank where the first influent is fixed. Now, this filling can be with or without mixing and with or without aeration. Okay. So, they have the different attributes the role of mixing and role of aerations have the different attitude uh, kind of attributes in this filling system. So, that is typically the first system filling. Then it goes to the second step which is react. Okay. So, uh, in, in the second stage where the reaction takes place there also we can uh, kind of ensure what degree of filling or what degree of aeration we want, whether we want or not. 
So, again it is a condition specific. So, that becomes your typically first stage, this becomes your second stage. Then it goes to third step which is settle. So, in a third step this settles. Now, since we intend to settle the biomass grown in the system because this is also typically a uh, most usually an aerobic decomposition ok. Although anaerobic conditions also prevails we will talk about that how it prevails, but then in the third stage the mixing and aeration both are stopped. We do not need mixing, we do not need aeration because we want the biomass to settle. So, if we provide aeration or mixing it is going to create disturbances in the system and the biomass is not eventually going to settle in the system. From there we get to the fourth stage which is decant ok. So, in the decant what happened that treated waste water is decanted. So, we will get the treated waste water ok uh, in the decant process. Here also because we want to uh, like the sludge mass to settle whatsoever the sludge mass was here in this thing to settle and then we want to decant the effluent. So, we do not want mixing or aeration in the decant stage as well. And from thereafter, it eventually goes to a idle stage, which is the next stage or kind of fifth stage of SBR cycle. So, here again the kind of uh, sludge is kept in a idle stage and we may or may not provide mixing and aeration and then part of the sludge is wastage from here and again from idle it will go to the next stage from this sludge we will get a new batch of the wastewater. Okay. So, this is your this is going to be a new batch of wastewater. So, that is how the operation in a SBR takes place like uh, the water goes to a fill system then react then settles then decanted and the sludge mass is kept in the ideal condition part of sludge is wastage and then the new batch is filled in this tank. Okay. So, that is how this is kind of a cyclic process. Uh, this is the entire operation cycle of a typical uh, SBR, typical uh, sequencing batch reactor system where it the water goes through all these different stages and so is the sludge produced over there. So, if we see these different cycles in the first cycle which is the filling. Okay. So, in the first cycle there is uh, the fill is just the basin your batch basin will receive the influent wastewater. Okay. So, uh, again as we are saying that mixing and aeration can be varied in this filling cycle. Okay. Uh, we may have a different scenarios uh, depending on the extent of mixing and aeration that is being provided in the basin. So, there is a condition static fill, in static fill there is no mixing or no aeration. Okay. So, both mixing or aeration is not allowed. Okay. So, we do not have mixing or aeration in the static fill condition. So, what happens that influent waste water is just entering into the tank. So, this typically is used when we go for a startup of the facility okay. or uh, if we uh, if we want to operate a plant where we do not need to uh, go for nitrogen removal. So, we do not want the nitrification and denitrification process to take place that is not our idea. Then we can uh, go for a static fill without providing any sort of mixing or aeration in the filling tank or in the fill system. Okay. This may also be used when uh, like the there is no adequate inflow of the wastewater. So, in that condition also we may go for static fill condition. Then there is another scenario which is the mixed fill condition. Okay. So, under this mixed fill these mechanical mixers are provided and they are operated. Uh, the idea of these mechanical mixer uh, uh, operating these mechanical mixer is because we are getting influent wastewater from one end and then we are kind of having your uh, the sludge mass in the system. So, the idea of this uh, mechanical mixer is to homogeneously distribute the sludge mass within the wastewater system. So, it is basically kind of uniformly blend the wastewater and the biomass. So, that is what is the basic idea of the uh, mixed fill where there are mechanical mixers are used, but the aerators 
remained off, we do not go for operating aerators. So, idea here is not to aerate the system, just ensure the mixing of the biomass uniformly within the domain of the wastewater. So, why we do not need aeration? The aeration uh, like is avoided to kind of intentionally produce an anaerobic or anoxic conditions in the system. So, when because wastewater usually have very low DO and if you are not providing aeration, so the DO remains dissolved oxygen remains very low and the conditions become septic kind of like anoxic or anaerobic conditions will prevail. Now, what is the point of keeping this anaerobic or anoxic condition is if you recall the discussion in the advanced treatment um, uh, processes what we had last week. So, for the removal of nutrients say nitrogen and phosphorus, we need the anoxic condition at some stage. The denitrification will only take place when there is an anoxic condition and similarly your uh, for the removal of kind of phosphorus as well. Okay. So, how, how your phosphorus uh, biological removal of phosphorus, we need to provide anoxic conditions so that the phosphate can be released in the system the phosphorus can be released in the system which later will be accumulated in the aerobic conditions. So, if we intend to remove the nutrients, we need to kind of ensure anoxic condition at some stage. So, uh, although uh, for nitrification denitrification purpose, the anoxic condition is better placed if it is done after nitrification. So, once the nitrification is done, then we go for denitrification, but we have the other system as well where uh, we can first like uh, if there are a, like existing nitrate or those kind of thing in the system. So, we just go for the denitrification process in anaerobic system and later on after nitrification whatever nitrate is then that can actually be recycled also if it is needed or we can create anoxic condition in the later stages as well as we will be discussing. So, what happens that a basic like kind of uh, in the absence of aeration, the anoxic condition or anaerobic condition will prevail and that will promote denitrification as well as release of the phosphorus in the system. So, that is the advantage of kind of mixed fill and then the third type is the aerated fill where both aerator and as well as your mechanical mixer units are activated both remains on. Okay. So, the content of the basins are aerated intermittently to produce aerobic as well as anoxic conditions. So, both thing actually can be uh, achieved. So, uh, we, we may keep both on or we may at times keep the aerator off. So, what will it will do? It will pro produce a cycle of aerobic and anaerobic conditions, okay. a cycle of anoxic and uh, aerobic conditions and that will kind of trigger the nitrification and denitrification process if you want the removal of the nutrients from the system. So, that is the fill stage. Then we go to the next stage which is react. So, react stage is the typical uh, stage where these biochemical reactions takes place that is why we call it react. So, those biochemical reactions which allow the removal of carbonaceous BOD, the major objective of the wastewater treatment is the removal of the dissolved organic matter or soluble BOD that way. So, those uh, organic matter which uh, kind of produces this carbonaceous BOD are removed okay, in the react phase and this removal takes place at a quite rapid phase, phase as opposed to the uh, conventional uh, activated sludge process. Now, why it reacts rapidly? Because what happens in conventional activated sludge processes, they, they are they, uh, those are typically kind of continuous flow system. So, what happens that we are receiving the influent continuously in the system and that keeps on diluting the BOD and that is how we get a net BOD in the system. But in batch processes, since there is no new inflow, so no kind of uh, no that sort of uh, hydraulic or organic loading rate in between the process. So, the, no variation in the hydraulic and organic loading rate and that is how the bacteria kind of quickly degrade the carbonaceous BOD at relatively rapid rates. Nitrification also occurs by, by kind of allowing the mixed mixing and aeration to continue, okay. while the majority of denitrification takes uh, will be happening at the prior stage. 
So, we already have kind of uh, stage where denitrification uh, we said that in the mixed fill particularly or in even in the case of aerated fill we can switch off and switch on the aerator. So, that way uh, producing a cycle of nitrification and denitrification. So, here because it is a kind of uh, we need to go for removal of the soluble BOD which is done in aerobic condition. So, we have to keep kind of aerators on for large period of time and that is how the uh, removal of BOD and nitrification takes place in the system. The phosphorus which has been released during the mixed fill or earlier anaerobic stages. Okay. So, uh, that will again uh, get accumulated in the cell mass as we discussed in the biological phosphorus removal steps. Okay. So, that phosphorus which has been released or if there are some additional phosphorus in the system will be taken up during this react phase. So, that is how it ensures the removal of nutrients as well and removal of the uh, CBOD. So, after react we go next to the settle phase during this phase the activated sludge is allowed to settle under uh, kind of uh, question conditions. Okay. So, the activated sludge here will settle as a flocculated mass and that kind of frames a distinctive interface with the clear water supernatant. The sludge is also called as sludge blanket. Okay. Now, uh, this phase is a kind of critical part of the cycle because if we are not able to settle the solids properly then it goes to the next stage and we may see the biomass washout or sludge washout taking place in the uh, kind of next decant phase which will be following the settle phase and thereby uh, kind of the quality of the effluent will be degraded because we will have biomass coming in the effluent water. So, that is why it is kind of of very high importance to let this sludge settle properly and we are just able to decant the supernatant in the next phase. We do not allow the sludge to come out to the uh, next phase decant phase and from where if we are decanting the supernatant if we are decanting the water. So, sludge also comes out with that that condition is totally undesirable we do not want that condition to happen. Okay. Now, uh, the next cycle is the decant phase. So, during this decant phase a decanter is typically used which is uh, which is kind of set or given the objective of removing the clear supernatant effluent. Okay. So, the treated waste water is separated from the sludge mass in this decant stage. So, once this settle phase is complete this is the next step after the settle phase. So, once the settle phase is complete a uh, kind of signal will be sent to the decanter to initiate the uh, opening of the uh, kind of effluent discharge walls. So, what happens there are uh, different like two different type of decanters typically are used there are uh, floating arm decanter and fixed arm decanter. So, these floating decanters uh, maintain the inlet wall slightly below the water surface because they are floating. So, as your water surface decreases these decanters will basically be able to kind of the level is maintained just little below the water surface. So, that the water actually goes through that uh, we are to the decanter and from there it is taken out. Okay. While the fixed arm decanters allow operator to lower or raise the level of the decanter as a whole it is not floating that way it is just fixed arm, but still we can have the uh, we can change the levels whether uh, till little lower or little upper that way. So, uh, it is uh, operator needs to basically change the level of decanter here whereas, floating it is already on the water surface and the level of decanter is little below the water surface. So, whatsoever is there will actually be uh, coming collecting in the decanter and through that it will be collected to the uh, final effluent channel. So, uh, another point that one needs to see because many times this scum and froth may also come at the top. So, your decanter should not decant that scum and froth. So, there those layers has to be prevented and protected or removed separately and they should not come along with the effluent channel. Okay. Another criteria that one needs to see is that the vertical distance between this decanter and the bottom of the tank should be sufficient enough should be good enough to avoid disturbance in the settled biomass. 
because in the just earlier phase we have the uh, settle phase where the biomass settles or the sludge settles. Now, if we take our decanter to a low level and it may create the disturbances in the biomass level. So, that biomass will again come in the resuspension and it will wash out with the uh, effluent. So, it will go through the decant system that we do not want. So, that is why we want to maximize the distance between the decanter and the bottom of the tank or the sludge level with an idea that minimum disturbances are there to the sludge level and we have to have a sufficient distance maintained always ok. So, uh, because otherwise it will uh, kind of will create problem. So, conceptually it is better to the decant volume like uh, because we want eventually the like the water which is coming in to the system has to leave the system. So, decant volume over a kind of static period of operation should be same as the inlet volume. So, the amount of water which is coming the same amount of water should be leaving the system through this decant system. The last stage is the idle stage ok. So, this step occurs between the decant and fill phase ok. So, we have uh, water coming in the fill phase and we have taken the water out of the decant phase. So, in between we keep an ideal phase this kind of time in this ideal phase varies on the influent flow rate and the operational strategy as well. And the idea of this phase is that small amount of activated sludge at the bottom of SBR basin is pumped out which is the sludge wasting. So, excess sludge which has been produced will be pumped out and the minimum sludge level is maintained and then your next batch of the water or next batch of the raw sewage raw waste water or raw industrial effluent whatever we are willing to treat will directly come into the uh, uh, like uh, tank in a fill stage after this idle stage. So, that is how there are like uh, uh, that is how we again go back to this cyclic process. So, uh, we after idle uh, keeping this system idle for some time we again go to fill in this and that is how our cycle or cyclic process uh, continues further. So, this is what happens in an SBR operation cycle. So, now um, you see the processes are essentially same we are getting the uh, removal of CBOD through uh, your typical uh, micro aerobic degradation in the presence of air which we are getting in the conventional activated sludge process as well. We are getting uh, the removal of nutrients through the anaerobic aerobic maintenance processes which we uh, may get in a kind of modified activated sludge process for nitrification denitrification either single stage or combined stage and phosphorus removal also if we intend to uh, achieve that. So, uh, those processes are same in uh, like we have a secondary settling basin here we are having a kind of uh, settle phase and then uh, decant phase. So, that does the job of your secondary settling basin in the same batch uh, in the same reactor ok. And uh, we do not usually need the primary settling tank over there because uh, whatsoever is coming we are anyway providing a settling basin or settling phase and we are anyway loading water to the existing uh, sludge mass that way. So, we may even uh, at times uh, primary settling basin is provided though before SBR, but it is not mandatory we can have a SBR direct uh, coming direct operating with the effluent coming after the grid removal system or grid chambers. So, uh, that way we can actually remove the requirement of even primary settling, uh, we can remove the requirement of a biomass separation that way and if all the processes can be done in the same tank through this SBR cycle. So, if we see the operating principle, so we have various sequences ok uh, and then the that volume taken up as a percentage of the capacity. So, uh, that different volumes this sequence duration ok and these are the cycles. So, influent coming in this fill cycle then reaction then settle then decant and then idle cycle. The objective here is to substrate input ok and denitrification here it is carbon removal and nitrification in the settle phase it is clarification in the effluent phase it is treated water removal from these things and in the idle phase it is excess sludge removal. For aeration requirement here it is optional, so with or without it can happen. 
here for removal of the carbonaceous BOD we must need aeration. So, that will be needed these of course, do not need aeration. So, that is what is the kind of requirement and principles and that is how the like we may have influent mixer air to fill stage then go to the react stage then go to settle then draw or uh, decant whatever we call that and uh, finally, to the idle stage where waste sludge will be separated effluent will be separated from this stage okay, and effluent enters in this stage. So, that is how the operation of an SBR typically takes place. So, uh, this is getting more and more popular SBRs. Okay. Uh, there are quite a few installations across the world, several installations in India as well. Okay. There are uh, I think more than 4 or 5 SBR plants running in the Noida itself. There are uh, various SBR systems running in the different cities. Okay. Uh, just in the first slide of this uh, uh, lecture, you saw then SBR at Navi Mumbai Washi. Okay. So, it is uh, kind of getting more popular okay. and particularly for the smaller um, capacities it is far more popular, but uh, for bigger capacities also like that Navi Mumbai is uh, one is 100 uh, million liters per day SBR which is quite big of size. So, uh, the major advantage is there is little land required because uh, we do not need separate separate these things, things as done in a batch processes. So, this is uh, uh, land requirement will be lower, there is effluent quality is better, uh, we can have a fully automized SBR plant. So, everything is controlled with the SCADA or those kind of things that can be actually even conventional systems these days can be fully automized though. And then it has the resistance against shock loads and uh, kind of applicable for large range of domestic and hydraulic loading rates. The disadvantages it requires continuous supply of energy, there is uh, highly mechanized equipment, the control panel we have to kind of let the uh, control the wall, control the uh, decanter arms, control all those things. So, uh, that way like quite sophisticated system okay. and the effluent and sludge might require further treatment at stages if uh, it needs to be basically reused for say. So, we may need to go for a next stage of treatment for the removal of dissolved uh, metals or those kind of things which are not removed at this stage. Okay. So, that is what is typical SBR system. Now, uh, upgradation of this SBR is the sequential batch biofilm reactors which are SBBR. Okay. So, these SBBR can uh, be uh, like uh, sort of combined system where the SBR and biofilm growth takes place together. So, what happens in SBR we have a suspended growth system right uh, the uh, water is comes in a tank and then we have mixer and aerator. So, growth takes place in a suspended uh, fashion there is no media. So, there is no possibility of biofilm growth ok the bacteria remains in the suspension. Uh, in the SBBR which is a sequential batch biofilm reactor. So, what is done here that we provide additional support material or support media which is generally kind of inert media plastic or those kind of thing and uh, let the biofilm grow on this media. Okay. So, we have a biofilm growth in addition to the operation of SBR. So, from onset from outlook it will look similar like SBR system, but we have uh, additional media put in the reactor which allows the growth of biofilm on the surface of the media on the surface of the support material. So, these processes use these carriers these media carriers they are kind of designed to provide a protective surface. So, non reactive surface where the biofilm can grow okay, and uh, it will give an optimal condition for this cultivation of microorganisms or for the growth of biofilm okay, and these media are then freely suspended in the water. Okay. So, it is not a like packed bed system completely we just have media put in the water. So, this media also basically uh, remains in suspension. So, that way a higher surface area is provided because these uh, carriers will uh, have the media that, uh, that we are providing in the system will have the surface area over which the biofilm can grow or the microorganisms can grow. So, that way there is a higher surface area for the uh, growth of microorganisms there are more sites available 
for microorganisms to adsorb there and get grow. So, these biofilm carriers are used to kind of upgrading the current wastewater systems as well. The existing SBR systems or those kind of systems can also be upgraded that way. So, if we see the like these SBR uh, systems have attracted a great deal of attention due to its ability to take the advantages of both a biofilm reactor and a, uh, and a basically your conventional SBR or traditional SBR. So, traditional SBR is already there in addition we are having a biofilm growth that to in a suspended uh, system. Okay. So, that way in like pure biofilm reactors the biomass grows only on carrier whereas in SBBR biofilm and suspended activated sludge are in the same tank. Okay. So, there is a biofilm there is a suspended growth system. So, that way this SBBR are uh, quite kind of efficient than the conventional or traditional SBR system. Okay. Uh, these uh, carriers freely move in the wastewater, so they also remain in the suspension. So, in a way that biofilm is also actually in the suspension itself. So, there has been several studies performed by modifying the typical SBRs to provide high surface area for biofilm growth and these are kind of uh, getting uh, like these uh, SBBRs are being used for the treatment of domestic sewage, dairy wastewater, textile wastewater, tannery wastewater, leachate and even the nutrient removal and the pollutant removal efficiency are typically observed which are higher uh, than the traditional SBR systems. So, this are the that that is how the your sequential batch biofilm reactors operate which is just an extension or a little modification with the additional biofilm grown on a suspended uh, plastic carrier or plastic media in a SBR system. So, with this we uh, conclude uh, this lecture and in the next class then we will be talking about the uh, membrane bioreactors and moving bed uh, biofilm reactors uh, in the next class. So, uh, see you then, thank you.